Welcome to another power supply review video. Today it's about the Go4 PPS1610. I'm not sure how new this model is and I don't know the exact date it came out but it should be fairly new and full disclosure this has been sent to me for free for the purpose of this review by a seller on AliExpress so should you decide to order one of these after watching the review video there will be a link in the description below. You may know I am a big fan of go for power supplies. I have like five or six of these units on my workbench and they are generally my preferred way of powering stuff around the bench unless I'm dealing with like super sensitive analog stuff in which case I'm probably using my old trusty HP linear power supply. But the go for power supplies have been super reliable. For example, I have been using my first one since 2015. That's six years of usage already. And I have subjected that power supply to multiple assembly and disassembly cycles for various teardowns and reverse engineering and to various noisy and spiky loads and full load conditions. It has seen it all and it just hasn't failed me so far. And I don't know how many of my subscribers are still with me since the start of the channel, but my very first video was about a Gopher power supply, the CPS 3205 in uh, 2015 when I started the channel. And if you want to see how bad the video and audio uh, was back then, check out the video. I will link it on screen right now. It's going to be fun to watch it. They stuck with the horizontal layout of the power supply unit for a long time, but it seems that now they have released this PPS lineup which switches to a vertical layout of the power supply and I'm sure some people will love this layout more while others will not. It certainly has some advantages depending on the layout of your workbench like now it has these uh, mounting holes on the bottom so you could theoretically screw this down to a shelf to uh, prevent it from sliding back when you try to operate the front panel. But I must say the position of the rotary encoder is not the best on this uh, new layout. I'm constantly like hitting the output terminals uh, when I try to adjust the rotary encoder. I think I would have preferred the encoder to be located more towards the top of the front panel. Then it would uh, be more easy to, to adjust it without hitting anything around it. The sponsor of this video, Altium Designer, is one of the most advanced PCB design softwares on the market. Altium has some pretty advanced features which enable collaboration among multiple team members, so there is no wonder they are a popular choice in the professional PCB design world. Check out the link I've placed in the description below so you can sign up for a free trial of Altium. The mains power switch for this power supply is still on the back of the unit. I have gotten used to that but it's not ideal like many people I've talked to would rather prefer a slightly larger enclosure uh, but with the switch placed on the front panel. What's new in this version is that they have these uh, ventilation holes all around so this should help keep the unit cool and I have the uh, 16 volts 10 amps version here that's 160 watts maximum but as usual they are available in the 32 volts 5 amps and 60 volts uh, 3 amps versions as well. The unit is delivered with this low cost and rather thin uh, mains IAC power cable and this uh, also low cost and uh, thin pair of alligator test leads. Uh, I mean these would probably do the job if you don't have anything else but they should be replaced as soon as possible because they are of low quality and they're going to be uh, failing pretty soon. In terms of specs I'll put them up on screen uh, it's got less than 10 mV peak to peak output ripple noise reading accuracy is the same as the previous models uh, and that is 0.1% plus two digits it's got the same load regulation figure so they are pretty much identical to the NPS series uh, no obvious improvements here except for the fact that they are now uh, mentioning there is a zero overshoot for constant current and constant voltage mode so we will be testing that later on to see if that's really an improvement uh, if you haven't seen the NPS 1601 review video, I will link it on screen right now. There was an overshoot in constant current mode and it's all discussed in that video. If you're interested in the subject, check it out. In terms of protection, this unit has the same protection features over voltage, over current, over temperature and short circuit protection. Another addition to this power supply is the new preset mode and let me show you how that works. There are 20 preset channels in total and you can set voltage and current to store on each of those preset locations. And then if you activate the preset mode, 
first it will automatically turn the output off if you had it on that's a nice protection feature and then using the rotary encoder knob you just cycle through the different presets you have and they will be uh, showed here on preset 0 I have 5 volts 1 amp on preset 1 I have 7 volts 700 milliamps so I guess this could be useful for some repair and testing stations that only use a certain number of presets so instead of adjusting between those manually it's much easier now to jump through the list and uh, it's less prone to operator error I did run a bunch of tests on this uh, power supply but I will not bore you with all of the details of the testing that I've done but we'll quickly go through the results and comment on them. First I did a stress test by letting the unit run in full load 16 volts 10 amps for more than 30 minutes and here is a thermal image. The exterior of the case was pretty warm at around 45 degrees Celsius. Um, I could get higher readings on the internals through the uh, ventilation holes but certainly uh, not dangerously hot on the outside so it passed that uh, test successfully. Next up I measured its display accuracy for voltage and current in several steps across the entire output range using the original factory calibration and for voltage measurements I compared with my Agilent 34401 and it was just one count off which is really good. For current measurements up to 3 amps I used my Agilent 34401 and above 3 amps I used the Fluke 87. It showed very good accuracy bang on right from the lowest setting of 10 milliamps and stayed in spec up to 9 amps. Uh, it was just 10 milliamps out of spec for the 10 amp measurement but still that's very good spec. But one downside when compared to the NPS 1601 is that you get one less digit for the amp meter. Next up I measured the output ripple noise so I'm gonna start by showing you how I had my oscilloscope probe connected right to the output terminals of the power supply uh, to have the lowest possible inductance and the smallest possible ground loop by using that uh, small ground spring connection on the oscilloscope probe to avoid capturing common mode noise as best as possible. Uh, I have channel 1 set to AC mode, bandwidth limiter turned on, peak detect mode and uh, X1 probe settings and we're seeing about 7 millivolts peak to peak with the output of the power supply turned off but the power supply running. Now with the output turned on into a resistive load constant voltage mode uh, 1 amps we are seeing about 13 14 millivolts peak to peak which is already outside the spec remember the spec is 10 millivolts peak to peak and uh, this can only get worse as we increase the output current uh, to 1.6 2 amps or more uh, we're going to be seeing uh, higher peak-to-peak uh, -peak noise. But let's not forget that generally speaking anything under 20 millivolts peak-to-peak -peak noise should be considered good uh, especially if we're talking about the switch mode power supply and it's also very difficult to measure down to this kind of levels. The oscilloscope itself has some inherent noise floor which is about 2 millivolts maybe and I'm pretty sure we're also picking up some common mode noise uh, in my measurement setup. So in general this power supply gets very close to its uh, output noise spec and performs as expected and it's very likely that part of the noise that I'm measuring here is just common node noise that we're picking up from the uh, test measurement setup. Next I want to test for those overshoot scenarios so first I'll check for voltage overshoot and I have the power supply turned on output is off set to 5 volts I'm going to be turning on the output and the waveform is uh, perfect goes straight to 5 volt with no overshoot this is what we want to see but uh, this was of course with no load let's also test with uh, a 4.7 ohm resistor as a load in constant voltage mode this should put out roughly 1 amp at 5 volts and once again there is no voltage overshoot a bit of a strange hump in there on the waveform but you know nothing too bad now if you remember older models from Gopher suffered from current overshoot and that can be dangerous for sensitive electronics. What that means is that even if you have the current set to let's say 0.5 amp limit for example, I would, it would still go above that until it starts to regulate properly and limit 2.5 amps. And to measure this I'm going to be using my joule scope which is the perfect tool for the job. It has this uh, huge dynamic range and we can capture everything that happens on the output of this power supply. We're using the same 4.7 ohm resistor but this time the power supply is set to limit current at uh, 0.5 amps and here is the waveform we're getting. We definitely have an overshoot up to approximately 574 milliamps 
and it takes about 50 milliseconds to get back down to the set limit of 0.5 amps. Now if you remember the NPS 1601, the previous power supply from Gopher that I reviewed, it was reaching about 1.1 amp using the same test setup and values. So this is definitely a good improvement. The current overshoot is now much smaller and there is now a very low risk of uh, this damaging sensitive electronics when you drive them in constant current mode. So they did indeed improve the response time in constant current mode. Thumbs up for that. Now I'm sure many of you would like to see a teardown of this power supply, so let's start disassembling the unit. So it looks like they have split the power supply section into two boards and they still have the third PCB for the uh, front panel. Now this, even though uh, it could be very similar uh, architecture uh, to the previous models, it just feels more complex just because of the two board uh, construction. I mean this could easily double the assembly time in the factory just because the workers now have to put in these uh, two layers of boards, uh, uh, solder them together and then put these uh, lock washers in there for each of the uh, active devices that screw to the sidewalls for heat sink capability. So this is pretty much how it all comes together. Now I'm going to remove some of these connections to make it easier to inspect. I'm also going to be uh, desoldering uh, these two red wires just to be able to get a better look at these boards. So it looks like they have used the usual filtering and uh, protection on the mains input side. Uh, then the signal goes through rectification, it gets filtered and then switched by the uh, two MOSFETs and then up through the two red wires which are connected to the input of the uh, transformer. This is the input side and this sits on the second board. Uh, then it once again goes through rectification with these diodes and then gets filtered by the, these uh, inductors and capacitors. Now this could be an early uh, prototype or an early uh, batch of these power supplies uh, because we do have some bodges like we can see here some resistor needed to be bodged near that IC which could be uh, a current measurement IC but as I've noticed in uh, previous teardowns these things tend to go away in future batches so if you get a newer one it's likely that this has already been resolved and included in the main manufacturing process. Soldering quality is not the best I have seen. We do have uh, flux residue, but I don't see anything specifically wrong with the solder joints themselves. There is no heat shrink over the mains uh, input wiring, but we do have uh, grounding and the uh, various grounding points uh, that connect to the enclosure. There's a second one on the second board. Uh, they are connected with screws and uh, lock nut washers to the metal case so all in all it's not great but not terrible either. I will take a few high resolution images of these boards and put them up on the blog post which will be linked in the description of the video. Now I'm gonna put this back together and give you my final thoughts. I'm gonna start by saying that you used to be able to get the uh, latest power supply in their lineup which was the go for NPS 1601. Uh, which I have here for about $50 shipped from AliExpress or uh, Amazon that was until about two years ago which was an awesome deal because there wasn't anything on the market to beat that. Sure you could talk about the Raiden power supply units but the performance on those units just doesn't match the one on the Goford power supply and I'm talking about output noise, regulation, all that sort of stuff that we care about and also in terms of cost a complete Raiden bench power supply was gonna cost more. Now that $50 uh, price tag isn't true anymore, now it's more like $75 shipped from AliExpress, uh, that is if you live in the EU and they also add in the VAT for one of these uh, power supplies and we have to consider that more than five years have passed since uh, these uh, first came on on the market. I don't know, I reviewed mine five years ago but they could have been on the market for more and yes they did change the layout to a vertical one uh, but ultimately the power supply inside is more or less the same as it was five years ago in terms of functionality. And users these days just want more. You want a bigger, a brighter display with more settings and features. 
Yes, these go for power supply still offer good performance uh, for the money, but I'm guessing the gap is closing and the competition is starting to offer uh, similar specs with more features for approximately uh, the same cost. Now, even if you do like this uh, simple uh, seven segment display or you are willing to accept it like I am doing, uh, there are still some annoying stuff that they haven't even tried to fix, like the fact that you still have the power switch on the back Many users would just prefer a slightly larger enclosure but have the uh, power switch on the front. And there is also the fact that every time you try to adjust a value, the cursor will then automatically reset to the least significant digit uh, so it doesn't remember the last digit that you adjusted. It's these little things that power supplies from other manufacturers do better and I'm guessing there won't be long until we'll find another $75 power supply with similar performance but a better user interface. So if you are looking for a vertical format power supply with reasonably low output noise like under 20 mV peak to peak and you are willing to live with the uh, user interface limitations then by all means get one of these and use the link I've placed in the description. Otherwise, I would like to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. If you know of other power supplies on the market which have similar specs, 0 to 30 volts, 0 to 5 amps, under 20 mV peak to peak output noise with fairly good load regulation, fairly good construction quality and a better user interface uh, with more features, but about the same price tag of $75, just let me know in the comments below. Don't try to put links in the comments because YouTube will automatically filter those as spam. Just name the model and number. This was my review of the Go4 PPS series power supply. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please consider hitting that like button as a thank you for this free content or maybe consider becoming my Patreon supporter for as little as $1 per month. Thank you for watching and I will be seeing you next time with a new video.